My name is Joy Truesdale and I am the director of Wedgefield University for Kids. We accept children aged six weeks old to five years old and we teach the ABECA curriculum. At Wedgefield University for Kids, our passion is children, but is also sharing the word of God with them so that they come to a salvation knowledge of Jesus Christ. I was raised in a Christian school. My mom and my dad were involved in Christian school um, all of my life. Uh, my mom and dad started a Christian school and I have continued that legacy to work in Christian education as my ministry. God has given me a passion for children and I would like to share that passion with other people. I think being in education is a gift that God gives you and to be able to do something that you enjoy as your ministry as well as your job is such a blessing. Um, children are like sponges and they absorb everything that you teach them and that you train them to do. And I think it is a great and high calling that God has given us to lead children to walk in his ways. Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And that is such a challenge in our homes as well as in our education, in our churches, in our schools, to train those children to be God-fearing children, but also to have a passion for God and to learn how to have a relationship with God and how to make God their best friend. Wedgefield University for Kids and Wedgefield Baptist Church is located at 6220 Wedgefield Road. It is right off of 261 in a travel route to Columbia and Shaw Air Force Base. Also, it is only about 15 minutes from Sumter. Uh, we will be open from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. If you would like more information about Wedgefield University for Kids, you can call 803-494-3887 or you can send us an email at wukids at ftc-i.net.
Good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. It's been a blessing already, hasn't it? Some glad morning when this life is over. I'll fly away. I'm going to check out of here. Amen. Amen. I've got a mansion over the hilltop. I've got a stock pond in the backyard with some large mouth trout, two or three brim beds. I got some, some ultra high season in the cabinets. Amen. It's going to be wonderful, isn't it? And I won't have to take no Rolaids when I get done. <laughs> All right. Good to see you in the house, Lord. I, I noticed a number of visitors there raising their hands. First time at Wedgefield. It's good to have all of you. It seemed like you were over in this corner, kind of maybe a few back here. Wherever you are, it's good to have you here in the house of the Lord. We'll stay. Miss Bobby, good to see you. And that old chicken thief you got right there brought him too, eh? <laughs> Amen. Felt sorry for him, didn't you? Just load him in the old wagon and bring him. Amen. We love him too, sister. He's a good guy. Good to see uh, Mr. Larry and his family with us too. Good to have all of you here today. If you have your Bibles, we're going to read a pretty lengthy. In fact, we're going to read the whole chapter of Romans chapter 12. I got into that thing this week, and I couldn't quit reading. I just had to read it over and over and over again. And after practice Thursday night and, and singing that last song about heaven and that last song about heaven and going home, boy, I wanted to preach on heaven something terrible. I told the Lord he needed to change his mind, let me preach on heaven, but he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. He said, no, you should stay where you're at. This is what we need. But you know, I, I can't help but believe church ought to be a little bit like heaven. Church ought to be a little bit like heaven on earth. You know what I mean? There ought to be some resemblances, some similarities between our heavenly home and our, and our earthly church home, our earthly family here. Um, it ought to be, you know, you think of heaven, you think of a place of peace. You think of a place of love. You think of a place where people don't kill you. Church ought to be like that. A place of love, a place of peace and joy, a place you go where, where people love you. They don't want to harm you. They want to help you. Uh, and they want you to know it. They want to be your brother. They want to be your sister. They want to be your helper. They want to be your prayer warrior. And I believe church ought to be a little bit like heaven. In fact, I think so much the fact that, did you know, do you realize what God feels about church? Have you ever really studied the scriptures to understand what does my God feel about church? I have opinions about church, some of us would say. I've been raised in church. I know what church is all about. I've been to Sunday school. I sing in the choir. I understand uh, we have church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. been to those. I understand that. But do you, have you ever stopped just to think what is God's opinion about church? Have you ever thought about it? Do you realize that it's his idea? No man ever thought about church. Church is his idea. It's his institution. It's not yours. It's not mine. It's not the leaders before us. It's God's idea. It's his institution. The scripture says, Christ said, I will be glorified in the church. As a matter of fact, he died for the church. He said, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. He died and shed his blood for the church. The Bible says right now he is sitting on the right hand of God. He is interceding for the church. God has an idea of what this thing should be like. If he died for it, shed his blood for it, he is interceding for it, which means he is praying for it now. He is praying for it to be fruitful. He is praying for it to be prosperous. He's got an idea about it. He's got an opinion, and we need to know what it is. And the last thing the Bible says about the church is God is coming back. Jesus Christ is coming back himself to take it home. Amen. So I believe his idea and his opinion would suggest that the church, the local assembly, should be a lot like heaven, and there should be some similarities. I want to talk to you about that. With that in mind today, Here's an awesome thought for me. I have the privilege of serving in a church that's been here for 132 years. That blew my mind. Of those 132 years, I counted it up yesterday, there's been 25 preachers, which I'm one. Blows my mind. Over those 132 years, I'm sure there's been some struggles. 
132 years is a long time. And with people in it for 132 years, I know there's been some struggles. That's just the way it is. But we survived. We survived. We're still here. We're still in the game. We're still in this corner sharing the gospel. We're still baptizing. Did you know we still believe in baptism here at Wedgefield Baptist Church? We believe in soul winning. We believe in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with mankind, with all, of, with all of his people. Do you know that? We still believe that. Amen. We still believe the blood. Amen. We still believe that the blood, the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. I don't want another program. I don't want another denomination. I like just what we're doing right here. We still believe the blood cleanses from sin. Amen. We still believe Jesus was, was died, that, that, that he died, was buried, rose again the third day, ascended into heaven, sitting on the right hand of God, and one day he's going to come back and get us out of here, and we're going to forever, the Bible says, be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. He says, we still, we still believe that. Here's what I'm getting to. Here's a staggering statistic. Here's a staggering statistic. Staggering statistic. There are researchers who say that between 3,500 and 4,500 churches close their doors every year in America. Between 35 and 4,500 churches close their doors every year in America. So what that means is while we've been here for 132 years, 528,000 churches have closed their doors. That's just simple math. But isn't that staggering? We're still alive since we've been here. Over a half a million churches have died. They've quit. They shut the doors. They went home. Does that stagger you? But we're still alive. Thank God. We're still alive. But here's the thing. It don't mean we always will be. It don't mean we can't die. If over 500,000 other ones can, can do it who never thought they would, we can do it too. I wanted to preach on heaven. I really did. But the Lord said, no, I want you to preach this right here. Recently, I read a newsletter article. It's a newsletter dated 1959. I read the article that caught my attention, which is this. Ten ways to kill your church. Ten ways to kill your church. Now, I'll tell you, there's more than ten. There's more than ten. But as I read that article, it, it, it intrigued me at how it looked like today. It looks like there's really no difference from what I know, what I've learned over the past few years about church. So... Let's look at this article. It's not my work. It's somebody else's, but I want to share it with you and, and paraphrase some of the stuff and put it in my own, uh, my own style and my own opinion. So with that in mind, Romans chapter 12, and I, I really need to read this whole chapter. I'll try to be brief with these 10 ways, but I really got to read this. So I, just, just sit tight, okay? I'm going to give you a break this Sunday because I don't want you... I don't want you interrupted by anything. Now, I'm going to ask you, we have, a lot of, we have a lot of activity during our church service, people getting up, going to the bathroom. I, I understand some of you folks can't help it, but for the most part, if you can, don't move. Please. I don't want anybody to be interrupted because I want, hey, our church should resemble heaven. Amen. And so Paul had a lot to say about that in Romans chapter 12. I read this thing this week. And I texted some folks in the church. I, was just, I said, you've got to read it. The whole church needs to read it and memorize it. I'm not being sarcastic or funny or evil or, or anything. It's, it's just good. Listen to it. Just listen. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good an acceptable and perfect will of God. All of us could quote that. But now it gets into the church, into the service of the church, and it says, For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man a measure of faith. For as we have many members, all right, here we are, 
Here's the church. The body of Christ, the bride. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Our ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation, and he that giveth, let him do with simplicity. And he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation, and hard that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Now he's talking about those gifts that the body of Christ have. When you got saved, you obtained a gift from the Holy Spirit. And he's telling you here, whatever that gift is as a, bar, a part of the body of Christ, use it. Use that gift. So he's saying, get active. He's saying, participate. He's saying, get on the ball field. Now, don't sit on the sideline. He's saying, let's get in the game, church. Let's go, church. Let's get busy, church. Be kindly affectionate one to another. Now, here's our conduct to one another. That's the body of Christ. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessities of saints, giving to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Now those words were written to the church. Those words are there for you and I on how we should behave and conduct ourselves in God's house. Remember, church ought to be a little bit of heaven on earth. It ought to be a place to go find friendship. To go find love, to go find compassion, to go find someone who cares. To go find someone who gives you hope that's out of this world. The hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, your sins can be forgiven. Yes, your soul can be saved. Yes, you can have everlasting and eternal life. But it's through Jesus Christ. And that's what we're here to do. That's what we're here to do. That's what Paul is instructing us right here. So what I'm about to tell you is not scriptural. When I go through these things, they're just an outline, a man-made. I don't want you to say Paul said this is in the Scripture. It's not, but I do believe that what I'm about to share with you is very accurate. Pray with me. Father, in Jesus' name, lead us and guide us now into all truth. Father, allow us to be able as your people to make the church of the living God a little piece of heaven on earth. God, we give you the glory. Give us the words now. Speak to our hearts in an amazing, astounding, life-changing way. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 132 years, 528,000 churches shut the doors. They died. What are some ways that we can kill a church? And are some of you and I participating in that very thing right now? And they're very simple. And again, I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just trying to be truthful. Let's take it and turn it into something positive. The number one way is don't come. Number one way to kill the church is just, just don't come. Some people have a hard time finding one hour a week to give to God. I just wonder what it would look like. If God only came to our house as much as we went to his. Do you realize how often he visits you? Do you realize it's in him we live and dwell and have our being? Do you realize you were able to get up this morning because he gave you life? 
Do you realize you were able to breathe his air? Because he let you through mercy and grace and long-suffering and patience and love and kindness. Do you realize this morning that the food on your back and the food that you ate this morning for breakfast, the shelter, your families, everything that you have, the Bible says they're gifts from God who giveth to us liberally and upbraideth not. You're able to come to a church where they preach the gospel and sing of the gospel and where we love one another and where we're friendly and we have a concern for the community and for the world and pray with God's people. What a privilege that is. But so many times we find excuse after excuse after excuse as to why we cannot come to church. Hebrews 10.25 says, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as the matter of some is. In other words, we need to be faithful to church. God has a pretty strong idea about his church. God has a pretty strong opinion about his church. And when the doors are open, God expects his people to be faithful and be in the house of the Lord. Excuses that we make. There's a man that we see Sunday after Sunday after Sunday who every time you see him, he's battling cancer. Every time you see him, he is sick. There's not a time when he is not sick. There's not a time when he doesn't feel bad. Yet you cannot make him stay out of church. He will find no excuse not to be in the church. It's Mr. Robert Walters. If Mr. Walters doesn't make excuses, my friend, most of us can't make excuses. Miss Eileen Smith. She's out of here today. That's one of the rare times I can remember her not being in church. I bet you she wanted to come. I bet she made no excuses. I bet Brother Sid made her stay home for her own good. We don't have the excuses that we claim that we have when it comes to not going to church. There's not an excuse good enough. I do not believe that I'll stand in the presence of God and hold. I just don't. Brother Phil Kidd said there's only one reason you shouldn't go to church. And that's if you die. And he said, if you do, how about mail us a, a death certificate so we'll have that on file? <laughs> Y'all wake. Someone said this. They said, the great task of the church is not only to get sinners into heaven, but it's to get saints out of the bed. Number one, don't come. Number two, if you come, make sure you're late. You say, that don't really make any sense. Yes, it does. It it, it shows our lackadaisical attitude toward God. This is what it says in my mind. This is what it says when we're late. I know things happen sometimes, but there's some folk who never on time. This is what it says. It says, I'll get there. When I get there. And God can just wait till I get there. When I worked at Colorfire, we each had badges. Some of you work in plants now, you still do, you have badges. When you go and you have to punch in, you have to when you leave, you have to punch out. We were on the point system. You got forty eight points a year. If you went over forty eight points, guess what? You had to go stand in the cheese line because you didn't have a job. Well, if you didn't show up, it was X amount of points. If you called in, it was X amount of points. If you were late, it was X amount of points. If you were late more than three times, you had to go stand in that line again because you were fired. They expected you to be on time. I wonder if we treated our jobs like we do church, the church of the living God, the one who instituted his idea, the one who died, shed his blood for it. I wonder sometimes if we showed up for work like we do church, how long would we have a job? And yet, my friend, the house of God is way more important than the job. Being tardy reflects our attitude. Our lack of punctuality is an overall view of God. I really believe it. Just wait till I get there. I'll be there when I get there. If I don't get there, fine. We'll just go to the restaurant early. I've heard that. I've heard it. Don't show up. Number two, show up late. Only show up when the weather's good. Boy, I hate a cloudy Sunday. I don't like a rainy Sunday. It, every time I said, Lord, please just let the, com- the sun come out for a little while. Because I know what's going to happen when the weather is not 
good. The sun's not out and there's clouds in the sky. People, a lot of people, not saying you, but a lot of people will only come when the weather's good. And we call them something I think we've created, fair weather Christians. Vance Havner wrote a poem about his father. I don't know if you've ever heard of Vance Havner. Great teacher of the word of God. Great writer. This is what he wrote of his father, who made no, no excuses, was faithful day in and day out to the church. He says, whether the weather be good or whether the weather be hot, whether the weather be cold or whether the weather be not, whatever the weather, he weathered the weather, whether he liked it or not. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It might be cloudy, but it's still church time. Amen. It might be raining, but it's still church time. It might be sleeting, amen, but it's still church time. Let's go to the house of the living God and be faithful to the one who's faithful to us each and every day. Amen. amen. The fourth thing, oh boy, it gets sticky now. Where's my life, my bodyguard at? Brother, will you got me? Again, I'm not being funny. I'm just being real. And I didn't write this. Let me remind you that again. I'm just sharing it with you, but the, these I do believe. Number four is find fault with everything and everybody. Let's go to church and pick on it and see what we can find wrong. Let's go see what we can spot, what kind of problems that we can find. This is what the guy said. He said, most homicide investigators begin researching those who had something negative to say about the victim. Similarly, when a church dies, you can be sure that the fault finders are prime suspects. These are folks who sit in the seat of the scornful. It's funny how these people, they, they complain, they spot problems, but they never solve any. They've never got an answer. They've never got a, a, a cure. It's always just problems, problems, problems. Faults, faults, faults. Preacher preaches too long. Preacher don't preach long enough. Preacher preaches too loud. He don't preach loud enough. I couldn't hear the preacher. Could you hear him? If you can't hear me, we need to go to the doctor. I'm not hollering today, but this is not my normal preaching style. But I preach so you can hear me. I mean for you to hear me. I want you to hear me. The choir sings... I don't like their songs. It's too, they're too loud or they're not loud enough or they're, they're too old or they're too new. I, I don't know. I just can't get in. I'm a Sunday school teacher. How he just tells jokes all the time. He don't never preach the word. Or the preacher don't never tell a joke. He's just always serious and preaches the word. I mean, you can find arguments both ways all the time. Problems. The deacons, I don't know what they're doing. They're not doing their job. I don't know why y'all got Pastor Paul there. I, my, my goodness, it's just problems, problems, problems. That's not what church is about. Remember, it's supposed to be a little part of, uh, a little like heaven on earth, you know? I just can't believe when we get to heaven, we're going to be looking for problems. You're not going to find any. You can look for the first million years, but you won't find any problems. But some of us are so used to it, when we get there, we'll be looking for them. We'll be sitting around the throne of the Lamb trying to find a problem with that angelic choir. They're too loud. Get over it. Amen. Get used to it. You're going to be here a while. Amen. <laughs> we don't go to church to find problems. And if we do find a problem, we take the Bible and we take that person we have a problem with or that subject that we have a problem with and we sit down like born-again Bible-believing Christians who have been brought up in the Word of God. We sit down, we take this book, and we solve them. Amen. Amen. Don't keep fighting and feuding over some piddly little thing that don't... Listen, there's no problems too big to solve, just people too little to solve them. Christians ought to be able to fix it. Take the book and fix it, amen. Smile, be happy, love one another. Go home with the Spirit of God dwelling in you so you can make a difference out there. My Lord, if I can't get along with you, how am I going to get along with them? And if you can't get along with me, how are you going to get along with them? If we can't get it right in here where the Spirit of God dwells and where we dwell in brotherly love, listen, we ain't going to get it right out there. We're going to fail miserably and get laughed at, be the lacking stuff of the community. Church full of hypocrites. All they do is fight each other. The battle's not in here. 
It's out there. Amen. And the Bible says, if we have a problem, if I got a problem with Jason, Jason's a Christian, I'm a Christian. I'm not going to go slap him upside the head because he'd beat me up, but <laughs> I'm going to go to him. I'm going to say, Jake, Jason, we disagree a little bit, but this is what I think scripturally. And he says, this is what I think. We take the Bible, we work it out. We're not going to always agree, but we should never fight. Right. We should end with, well, that's your opinion, and this is mine. And unless, it, unless this is totally out there, totally contradicts scripture. We should be able to come together. Most of the time, most problems are just simple little general problems that we should be able to, to, be able to solve. Amen? Amen? We ought to be able. Don't come to church looking for a fault. Come to church to worship. Come to church looking for God to show up. Amen? Amen? The fifth thing we do is we never accept the leadership role or responsibilities. We're renters. We're church renters. You know, when you rent, you rent an apartment, something tears up, you're not obligated to fix it. You call the landlord, and he comes and fixes it. We take no ownership. It's not my problem. Let somebody else fix it. That's not church. There's people renting pews. We're renters. We're not owners. We're supposed to take ownership. We're supposed to grab the church and ministry by the horns and say, this is mine. And I'm going to be active and I'm going to be a part of it and get involved in the church stuff. This fellow says leadership is not about position, it's about productivity. A congregation full of followers is only a life support in getting ready to die. Man, my friend, I cannot encourage you enough. If there's any truth of the scriptures that I want to get across to you right now today. Because this is, this is the thing that's going to keep us alive. This is the thing that's going to give us vitality. This is the thing that's going to make us vibrant and strong and make a difference. And that is take ownership. Get involved in something. Find something to do for the cause of Christ. The sixth thing is we, this is something that we do, is we become territorial. That's my kitchen. This is a big one, y'all. It's my classroom. Those are my tables. And that's not what the scripture, the scripture teaches. We just read it. It says, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members of one body. In other words, we're on the same team. We're on the same team, fighting the same battle, serving the same God, telling people about the same Jesus. And it's not tug of war. It's not tug of war. It's coming together in unity and harmony. As a body. Like, like my body. You know, it looked crazy if my, my feet wanted to go that way and everything else wanted to go that way. And we were always going against each other. At some point, my, all of them have to agree, we're going to go that way. We're going to Logan's. And go to Logan's. My feet can't go to Shoney's and my I mean, and that's what, so many times, that's the church. That's what the church looks like. One half church is going one way, another going this way, and, and that's not a one. It's just tug of war. We're pulling against each other. No, no, that's mine. No, it's mine. No, it's mine. No, it's mine. No, it's not. It's ours. We're one. We're the body of Christ. There again, you, you have to come together, and you have to make a godly decision on which direction we're going to go. Everybody can't have their way. Everybody can't have their opinion. Sooner or later, somebody has to give in to themselves. Somebody has to esteem others more highly than themselves. And that's what it says here in our text. That we are to consider, we are to render to others. 
and not always make it about us. I know I got to go. The seventh thing is you never give your opinion in a meeting. You wait till after the meeting. We have a business meeting, and, and you sit there. You don't say anything. We get out of the meeting, and you go have a meeting after the meeting in the parking lot or somewhere in the corner. And you go in the parking lot, and, 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 and you say, this is what should have happened in that meeting. This is what should have been done. And what should have been done is you should have voiced your opinion in the meeting while you had a chance. And don't have a meeting after me. We voted. It's done. It's over with. Let's go home. This guy says there's chalk lines all over church parking lots outlining exactly where the murder took place. Meeting after the meeting. Where we just killed everybody. We just killed that meeting. Killed that deacon who led it and the parliamentary group and all them. The eighth thing he said was do nothing more than absolutely necessary. We show up, we go home, that's it. We never get active, we never take hold of ministry. It's hard to reach the least of these doing the least that we can. If we're going to reach them, we need everybody. We need the church to be one body, working for one cause, for one Savior, for one God. Amen, it's quiet in here. Number nine was hold back on your giving to the Lord. Here's another one. Holding back on your tithing and giving will kill the church. It takes money to do ministry. I don't talk about money a whole lot, don't like to. I know you probably don't like to hear it, but the Bible does. Jesus has a lot to say about money. Jesus killed people for taking money. Did you know that? You ever read that in Acts? There is a Bible command to give our tenth unto the Lord because that belongs to Him. That's not yours to begin with. And when you don't give it, not only are you robbing God, but you're holding back ministry. You're holding back the possibility of doing well, you say all the church, all the church wants is money. Well, so does Walmart, but you give it all to them. Uh, amen. They want your money too. Amen. R.T. Kendall says this. It says, tithing is the solution no one talks about. If every Christian tithed, every congregation would be free of financial worries and could begin truly to be the salt of the earth. If every Christian would tithe, the church would begin to make an impact on the world that would change it. The church instead is paralyzed. One sure way to kill the church is hold back on your tithes and offerings. I can assure you today, Wedgefield Baptist Church would have no problem if everyone in here tithed and gave. Now, many of you do, and I thank God for that. And I'm not saying that there hadn't been many who, who, who have taken money and run and done crooked things. I'm not saying that it's never happened. It has happened. I'm aware of it. They will have to stand before God. Nevertheless, the Scripture is very clear. The operations of the church requires your money. It requires tithing. It requires offering. And let me encourage you today to take the scriptures at its word when it says that if we're faithful in our giving and our tithing, God will supply our needs. He will meet your needs. So holding back is one way to kill the church. And the last thing, and, and I, I don't have to beat this horse to death because you know I believe it so strongly, and this don't reach out to the unchurched. Don't re let's just stay in here and let's just have a good old time. Let's just stay in here and eat and listen to good music and listen to good preaching. And, and, and let's, just, let's just worry about the brotherhood. I believe that's as ungodly as anything else in the Word of God. I believe it's total and complete disobedience to what the Scripture teaches when it tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. When it tells us to go out into the harvest for it's plenteous. I believe the church, if we want God to bless us, if we want to thrive, we have got to find ways to reach out to the unchurched. That's the community. I know we've got a lot of visitors here today. This, this, may, this is not normal for us. But we listen, I want to be very clear with you. When we say God is here doing some wonderful things, He is. There's no doubt about it. God is in this place. If you hadn't felt him today during our worship, 
you, you don't know what it feels like when he's there. He's here. He's, we had three people to get saved last night that we didn't get to baptize today. God is saving people. There are people giving their hearts to Christ. We've got a man in here called to preach here in the last few weeks. Uh, we, we, God is just doing some wonderful things. We've got people who, that we pray for. I'm telling you right they're here because of this prayer list. I can tell you that right now. I've had doctors to tell me they're only here because somebody was able to get a hold of another world. God is here. We're doing some wonderful things, but we want to do more. We want to reach out further for the cause of Christ. And we need to understand what church looks like to God and how it ought to look like to us and what our conduct and behavior should be within this church, doing what God calls us to do. We came here a little over seven years ago. We started... Sunday morning service, we've always done that. When we started Sunday night service, we started Wednesday night service. Sunday night's done okay. It hadn't grown the way we wanted to. Wednesday night didn't grow at all. I'm not going to I'm not gonna throw rocks. I'm just going to say it didn't work. And sanity's doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. I couldn't get it to work. Maybe it was my fault, and I take the blame for it totally, regardless of whether it was or not. But... We felt like, we felt compelled that this is not going to work. Then we need, to, we need to put it to the side and maybe revisit it later and implement something else. I'm making a charge to you based on what we said today. We have stopped the Wednesday night. You'll notice it in the bulletin. We will not do Wednesday night Bible study, uh, study again unless God calls us back to do it. But what we are doing is working together with a group of men here in the church to establish a visitation program. That reaches everybody in the church, those who are sick, those who are shut in. And it reaches to everyone who, who comes in and signs a visitor's card. It reaches out to these people. It reaches out to the people in the community. An effective visitation program will be taking place in place of the Wednesday night Bible study. That is in the works. You will hear from it again here very soon. I, I feel like one of the things that we've not done so good at is being able to visit and get out and, and be where people are. But we are fixing to fix that. We're working on that in place of that Bible study. I want you to be praying that God would bless this. And I want you to be praying and asking God how you can get involved. You will be hearing about this very strongly in the next week or two. And I want you to ask yourself the question. I want you to be praying in your private time with God. God, what can I do to be a part of this ministry? What can I do to reach this world with the message of Jesus Christ? What can I do for the homebound? What can I do for the shut-in? What can I do for the sick? What can I do for my neighbor? What can I do for the visitor? To make them understand Wedgefield Baptist Church loves them, cares about them, and wants them to be a part of what they're doing, of the good things that God has going on. I want you to seriously, seriously pray about it. Ten ways to kill a church. One of those ways, don't get involved. Just don't get involved. Be a renter. Be a pew renter. I'm begging you today. This has been in my heart so strongly. I'm begging you, get involved. Do something. Invite people to church. Every week, invite, 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 invite. Share the gospel. Share your testimony. Let people see the love of God in you. Folks, that's what this is about. When he instituted it, I know for a fact it was his idea. Just what I'm telling you right now, that's what the Bible is all about. That's his idea. That's how it ought to look. I want you praying with me about it. I want you to be faithful. Come to church. Don't you love it? Don't you love being around God's people? Talking about Jesus, hearing about Jesus, singing about Jesus. Be faithful. Be faithful in your giving. Don't be a robber. Give God what's His and watch His work flourish. Watch people get saved because you gave. Vacation Bible school is expensive, but it's worth it today, isn't it? Amen. Them two little boys got saved, baptized. It was worth it. Couldn't have done it without you. Couldn't have done it without your participation. But we need more of it. The bigger the army, the bigger the, bigger the battle we can fight. Get involved. Be faithful to God. Come to his house. What would it look like if he only came to your house as much as you came 
or I came to his. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we ask that you help us to reach those who are listening and those we meet to come from the hedges and highways compelled to come to Wedgefield Baptist Church, not knowing why they're coming, but when they get here, they will not want to leave because they feel the Spirit of the Lord is at work here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.